You're listening to The Journey Podcast. Why do we often end up sabotaging ourselves and how can we stop and create the life we want for ourselves? Find out more in today's episode. Hi, I'm Petra Brunbauer and with decades of experience with sadness, pain, anxiety and stress, I finally figured out how to leave all that behind. And this podcast shows you how to break free permanently so you can reclaim your sanity and find the self-esteem and energy to go after the life you desire. With real talk about mental health, holistic healing, and the tough journey of coming out the other end, this is The Journey Podcast. Welcome to today's episode. Self-sabotage is a common behavior pattern that can be difficult to recognize and overcome. It refers to the ways in which we get in our own way, hindering our progress and preventing us from reaching our goals. Self-sabotage can take many forms, including procrastination, negative self-talk and self-destructive behaviors. Today, we'll be exploring self-sabotage and how it can impact our lives. By understanding the different ways in which we may engage in self-sabotage, we can begin to challenge the beliefs that underlie them and replace them with more positive and supportive thoughts. Learn more about self-sabotage and how you can overcome it to achieve success in this episode. Guido Szymanski is an international teacher and coach best known for his transformational programs with high achievers who are often in the public eye. Following a fortunate career on stage and screen, from playing in James Bond's Spectre to My Fair Lady, he now works with clients such as CEOs, professional footballers, musical theater stars and the occasional pop star. He helps them under all that pressure, not only to perform better, but also to be able to enjoy themselves and their success. He's the creator of the Successful Auditions Program for Creative High Achievers, the CD Angels of Forgiveness, and the online program Six Week Masters and the Power of Forgiveness. He recently launched Flow Club, a community to help you reach and stay in the highest vibration that is possible for right now. Guido has worked with the Royal Academy of Music London, the Voice College, as well as Fusion 5 Performance in Germany, was co-founder of the Network for Transformational Leaders and a founding member of the Changemakers. He has specialized in the high-achieving mindset and the techniques at the core of his work very often leave his clients with instant shifts in their lives. Here is my interview with Guido Szymanski. Hi, Guido. It's so great to have you on the podcast. I've been looking forward to getting to chat with you because we are going to explore self-sabotage and happiness today, which is such an interesting topic for holistic healing. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about this conversation. Yes, me too. And for starters, do you want to share a little bit about yourself and your story? Yes. Where do you want me to start? So I spent most of my life on stage. So I used to be a ballet dancer. I changed into acting and then ended up in playing a lot of musicals, which gave me an opportunity to look at how to perform under pressure and how to enjoy yourself on stage or how to not to enjoy yourself very much. And I found that 25 years that I spent on stage, I didn't really enjoy most of it. And I was always looking for ways to do that, to actually get to enjoy what I loved so much, because I was always standing on that stage trying to not be found out. When will people find out that I actually cannot sing, cannot act, I'm actually not that good a dancer? And I came across some healing and coaching methods at the time, even when I decided to stop performing my, you know, myself back then, that showed me that I was really just holding myself back and that there are ways for all of us to, dare I say, enjoy our talents, enjoy what we are meant to do on this planet. And I just went, my God, I spent so much time actually, here, here we are already at the title, sabotaging myself into not going further in my career and not really enjoying what I was able to do. And so I started coaching myself. I had my colleagues help me and things really 
developed from there. Today, I work with people who are very often in the public eye. And I help them on all that pressure to not only become the best and be the best, but really to enjoy their success. I remember working with a footballer who shared his story with me and he said, Guido, I have the success, the fame, the money, the wife. I play for my favorite club and I thought I would be happy now. And stories like this really get me because I think people are so extraordinary in what they do. I think pretty much everybody is so extraordinary, extraordinary just for being human. And then they don't get to enjoy how extraordinary they really are. And so I help professional footballers, singers, actors, CEOs, really anyone who has a mission to fulfill. So that was a big arch. Sorry, I went the complete way now. <laughs> That's perfect. And thank you so much for sharing your story. We definitely love to hear about where you come from and what you're doing now. It's interesting that you say that because you think of someone famous or someone who has a lot of money and you would think that they're probably very happy where they're at. They have many options and the funds to pay for those options. So it's very surprising to hear that often people in those positions actually aren't happy. And what makes you so passionate about the fact that people should be enjoying their success? Where does that come from? Really from, well, at first, really from my own experience, because when I started this coaching journey, I stopped performing. Colleagues started asking me for help. And so I, you know, I, it started expanding. And then six years later, I was asked to go back into a show that I performed in before, a little show called Cats, the musical. And I only had four days to go back into the part that I loved so much and that I was so fearful of because I was told so many times, you're not tall enough, your voice isn't big enough. But now I had these coaching techniques and I literally took me through whenever any insecurity popped up. I took myself through different routines, releasing techniques, and I got four days to rehearse that role again and go back on stage. And for the first time in, by that point, over 30 years, I went onto that stage and I thought, well, there's a lot of guys who can do this better than me. And there's a lot of guys who can't do it as well as me. But right now I have an audience to take care of. And I just went, oh my God, that is what it feels like to actually enjoy what you're doing. And you could argue that was being successful, playing a lead part in a big musical like this. And to finally go not into an arrogant or this, you know, I'm, I'm amazing kind of way, but more a I have a job to do here and this is good and I have fun doing this was mind blowing to me. And that was the moment when I decided everyone needs to know this. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your insight into that. And I would almost say that many people who are successful or who are on their path to being successful like that, they end up sabotaging themselves. And why would you say we do that to ourselves? <laughs> well, because it happens subconsciously. And in essence, it's a good thing because our subconscious mind is always trying to protect ourselves. So we are, you know, when we are born into this world, I often compare it to an empty computer, you know, that gets off the conveyor belt and it's just a machine, but it needs an operating system in order to understand what it has to do. And so we upload an operating system and that then decides what programs can run on this particular computer and which cannot. And for me, we as humans operate pretty much the same way. So we are born, we have no idea, you know, we can scream, we can eat, we can poop, we can sleep, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> and then over the first years of our life, we learn through observing and what we've been told how life works and what we're worth of and, you know, how relationships works, what money means. If, if there's always enough money, there's never enough money. I don't know, all men in my family get ill after a certain age or whatever stories we just, you know, learn about life. And we make them our operating system. And so because we are bombarded with so much information during our life, during every day, during every minute of the day, our brain has to filter out 
information. It's just too much. It would go into an overload. If you would compare it to a computer again, the computer would shut down after two weeks of, with all the information it would get because it's just full. And so our brain knows it has to filter out anything that's not significant. And what's not significant is anything that doesn't fit the already existing operating system. What I mean by that is we only allow information in that fits our already existing beliefs about ourselves. And if I believe I'm only worthy a certain success or I only will be loved if I work hard for it or money is evil, you know, stuff like this, if that is the operating system, if something that would be really, 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 really good for us would be staring us in the face, we would literally not see it because it doesn't fit the system. And so, of course, we're not sabotaging ourselves. But if I have learned that I'm not worthy of love and somebody suddenly approaches us who would be the love of my life, but I have learned that love will always hurt me and I will be left in the end anyway, or whatever the story is that we have learned about that particular topic, that person that approaches us is seen as danger because it would shake the existing system. And so what we do in, well, the particular coaching that I do is we explore those filters because we believe we make our choices, but the choice is already made before we start thinking. And so at the moment we start exploring the filters that everybody has, the, the operating system that someone has, it seems magical because suddenly all these amazing things start to happen. But what truly, what actually happens is you just open up your filter to what's already there. Mm -hmm. you let a new program in so to speak does that make sense yeah i actually was just going to ask you so if, if we stick with the analogy of the computer we do upgrades on our operating systems on the computers all the time i mean we don't use windows 98 anymore <laughs> we, <laughs> we move on and we upgrade <laughs> or it doesn't work anymore so why are we so scared of making these upgrades and why is it so tough to make these changes with ourselves do you think because the upgrade to the system means danger. Any change, well, not any change, but a lot of most changes mean danger to the system. If I have learned that I have to behave in a certain way to get a certain reaction, if I now challenge that belief, then everything will go danger, danger, don't change, don't change. You know, I call it the monkey on your shoulder will appear and will try to keep you safe. And only when we explore those systems, those programs, those beliefs, and we realize that they don't make sense anymore, they probably made sense to the seven-year-old, and they probably made sense to the 13-year-old, but they probably don't make sense for a 50-year-old anymore. That's when the whole system suddenly, it's almost like it crumbles and it opens up. That's when you delete and create space for something new to come in. But it's always trying to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is there anything that people could start with if they're experiencing that fear? Is there something that you help them with to begin that path towards opening up and towards updating all these old programs that are left behind? Yes, certainly. I mean, I always like to share that because we run these filters, I like to say our life is pretty much a replica of our belief system because we can only let in what our filters allow. So without judgment, without judging yourself too harshly, without thinking that you've done something wrong, no, you kept yourself safe. And we all do amazingly. I, I would say if your operating system wouldn't be good for you, you probably would fall off your chair because you forget breathing or something like this. <laughs> so it's most of us are doing really well. It's just those little things when you realize there is an area in my life where I keep running into the same wall, I would suggest start looking for the patterns. If, let's say, you know, you change relationships, but in the end, the energy or the dynamic in the relationships are always the same, even though the faces change, there might be a pattern there for you to look at. How do you always feel? It might be a pattern that you are feeding, not your fault. This is very important. It's not your fault. It might just be a pattern that you can now address and let go of. If you 
you know, always run out of money at the end of the month. And it doesn't matter if you used up $2,000 or $30,000, then that might be a pattern. And it's just interesting to look for patterns that are running in your life. And that is already greatly eye-opening for a lot of people. And then question yourself, okay, what would a different pattern look like for me or what would I want? How would that, you know, what, what if that would change? What if I would feel safe to have more money by the end of the month? The month is done and there's still, you know, I can actually build up some wealth. What if I feel safe in a relationship? And just those thoughts, I recommend you do this in writing. And I love the question, what if, because it doesn't state like an affirmation, oh, I am now lovable, for instance, and that's sometimes just too far out for some people, whatever sentence you choose. But if you start daydreaming with a what if question, you open the door to a possibility without creating resistance. And for me, that what if question is truly magic. And the next step would be, you know, if you, you asked how can you actually change those patterns is to look at, okay, what is the fear that is holding me back? Is that linked to any situation or any particular person? And that's when I get very passionate about the topic of letting go and dare I say forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting how you explain that. And I love your take and your perspective on that. And certainly now circling back to the beginning of this episode when we were trying to discern why people who are successful sometimes still don't have happiness. These patterns actually bring a bit of an explanation of why this happens, whether you are successful, not successful, whether you have money or you do not have a lot of money. In any of those cases, those patterns can still be there holding you back for you to explore. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, absolutely. It's almost like, as paradoxical as it sounds, that the happiness would be unsafe. And very often what I see, especially, no, I see that with, with most people, is the what I call the I'll be happy when syndrome. I'll be happy when I have a better job. I'll be happy when I'm married. I'll be happy when I get the promotion. I'll be happy when I moved to a different city. And it's almost like you reaching for the horizon or walking towards the horizon. It always keeps moving with you because the moment you move to the next city, you think, well, I'm here now, but I'll be happy when I have a better job in this city. And then you have a better job and then you go, well, I'll be happy when I have that promotion. So we never actually allow ourselves to be happy because we believe it's part of our culture. Unfortunately, we can only be happy when we have reached certain points. And the real trick, even to greater success, is to learn to find the happiness before, to enjoy each little step and go, well, this has been amazing. I'm already happy in this job but I want something better now. Or and, I should say, and I want something better now. I'm grateful for my health, and now I want to create a little bit more strength, for instance. I'm super happy in my relationship, and now I'm thinking about marriage, or now I'm thinking about kids, or now I'm thinking about becoming single again. Maybe that's the next step for someone. <laughs> yeah. And I guess it would fit really well at that point also to bring back in the journaling that you were talking about and to really explore in writing what you already have, the things that you already have achieved that you can be grateful for and that are now here in the moment to look at. And then maybe journal from there as, you know, some of the what if questions that you were posing before. Definitely. So journaling, especially gratitude, I used to think this is so overrated and, you know, it's just something that everybody says, you know, be grateful, do a gratitude list, but there's so much research on gratitude right now and what it does to a system. I, you know, I dare you start doing your research on gratitude yourself and what it does to you. It's incredible how it opens up our entire system. And Asking, then changing that or taking that into questions opens a particular part in your brain. It's called the RAS, reticular activating system. 
And it is that part of the brain that filters out what it thinks you don't need. But it will also always find the answers to your questions. And so in journaling, if we actually ask questions towards our goals rather than away from where we feel we're being held back, we open up completely new avenues. What I mean by that, that, that might have been a bit complicated. What I mean by that, if I ask, why am I always sick? For instance, I will get a lot of answers why I'm always sick. However, if I trick my brain, my brain is a very loyal servant, and so is yours. <laughs> if I ask the question, why am I now always so healthy? Even though I'm not, the brain will also look, because it is always trying to look for the right answer, it will serve you in finding better ways to support your health, as an example. So, and if we do that in journaling, starting with gratitude, going into the what if question, and maybe keep asking the right questions, it opens up so many doors, it's quite magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Wow. I do feel like I learned so much about journaling just in the last few minutes as you were explaining that fascinating. And looking back now from where you are at now over the past decades that you have spent changing and utilizing these and techniques that you have found and also changing your patterns, how have you changed? Do you feel different? Do you feel different inside, outside? How have you changed through all of this? Oh, this is such an interesting question. Thank you for asking this. I feel I am a completely different person and yet not at all. It's just almost like an unraveled a lot of the negative stories that I learned about myself and that I've been holding on in the past for so long. So do I still get triggered? Yes. Do I still feel sometimes fear or have to deal with stuff I don't want to deal with? Yes, of course. Absolutely. But where I used to be stuck in a negative cycle or a negative spiral for days and weeks or even months, it's usually done in, I don't know, 15 minutes because it's like, oh, there you are, old friend. Oh, my system is trying to protect me again. Now, that's not a nice situation. Let's see how we get out of this. It becomes more playful. I've certainly have grown a completely different understanding for myself and a completely different confidence, mm -hmm. as in, just feeling comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. And that is quite wonderful when you spend so many years not feeling that. Yeah, exactly. And that would make a big difference in how you feel and how you project yourself outward too, how you project yourself to others around you. They, I'm sure, have noticed that change as well about you. Mm -hmm. I think so, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And do you want to go over some of your own programs and services maybe so that listeners can get a feel for how they could connect with you if this episode aligned with them and they want to work with you? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Well, if I work one-on-one -on -one with someone, I created a 90-day process that I take them through and that allows us a good chunk of time to really dive deep, neutralize and release a lot of old patterns and create new strategies and new logical pathways. I know that's quite, that might be a little bit too elaborate for a lot of people. And so, dare I say, Corona has brought a big gift as in going online and creating courses to reach people. <laughs> and so I have two courses online at the moment, and one is addressing, it's called the Six Week Masters. And it's just giving you some, the basic understandings, how your tick, what your beliefs are, what your patterns are, and how you change them. And there's a small part of that course is already talking about forgiveness, because for me, that is the self-care tool and the number one tool to really make a change in your life. And I'm not talking about any religious background when I talk about forgiveness. I'm just saying taking your power back from something that you left with a person that doesn't deserve that energy anymore or a situation even. And so out of that, you know, participants kept asking, so what are we doing next? And we want to dive deeper. And so it seemed natural to create a course called Reclaim Your Power. It's a complete forgiveness method, and it takes you through the five different steps that I find a really holistic approach to really let go. Because so many people find themselves in a situation where they say, okay, I'm ready to forgive and let go. And they go through a process and they feel better for a day or two, and then it comes back. 
And that is because, you know, they missed a few very important angles. And so that course, and dare I say the book that is coming from that is very, very close to my heart because I think this has the ability to change lives completely. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And thank you so much for all this wonderful work that you're doing and the courses that you're offering. And we will be linking to all of Guido's offerings in the show notes as well. So be sure to check there on all of the ways that you can get in touch with him directly or work with him if you so choose. And this has been another incredible episode. And I really hope our listeners have enjoyed this journey into self-sabotage and happiness as much as I have. It has been fantastic chatting with you on the podcast today, Guido. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you for giving me this space. Thank you. Yes, it's my absolute pleasure. And keep on shining and doing what you're doing. I so appreciate your work and the difference that it makes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to listen in. If you enjoy the Journey podcast, please subscribe, share on social media, and leave us a five-star review. You can find more of the Journey on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and the Journey blog. Sending you love and courage and see you next week.